you for joining us for the Art of Public Speaking, According to Me, presented by Webinars by Rockwell. Our videos are designed to focus on the administrative professional and fit into your already busy schedule and not break the bank. We offer a wide variety of videos focused on interpersonal skills, technical skills, and experience and advice-based skills. With my 40 years of admin career experience. Watch for announcements on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube for additional content releases. Let's get started. Advice from an introvert. I just finished another run at my Myers-Briggs personality type test. When I received a new result, I was surprised, but again, maybe not. I initially took the test in the mid-1990s and re received results which I expected. ISFJ. Introvert, sensing, feeling, judging. It sounded just like me. The types have changed since that time and in my new result they added a T to my designation. That breaks down to introvert, observant, feeling, judging, and turbulent. Hmm. Just for clarification, the opposites are extrovert, introvert, intuitive, observant, thinking and feeling, judging, prospecting, and assertive and turbulent. So my result slightly changed in one area from the initial test results and added the T. The traits of the turbulent are opposite the assertive. They introduced a new designation as defender, of which I am one. I believe it would be wise to take the test every 10 years or so because our personalities do change as we mature and grow. These changes will also affect our careers, some positively and some negatively. Many of our trials that we go through through life help shape and change our personality characteristics depending on how we envelop them, work with them, acclimate to them, triumph or succumb to them. Check out all the personality types at 16personalities.com. Many years ago, I took another short survey to determine stress levels based on life events that you've experienced in the last 18 months. Those events can include a death in the family, separation or divorce, someone going to jail, personal injury, marriage, loss of a job, a retirement, moving, changing jobs, having a baby, your child leaving home, start or ending school, even going on vacation and Christmas are all major stressors. The full list can be found at news24.com slash medical slash stress slash about stress. So we've heard for years that the number one fear is public speaking. I'm not sure that's quite true. I think it's when compared to death, people fear public speaking more than they fear death. And that's how this has morphed into being the number one fear. But since the pandemic hit, the U.S. was surveyed and the top 10 fears for the year 2021 were loved ones dying, loved ones becoming ill, mass shootings, not having enough money for retirement, terrorism, government corruption, becoming terminally ill, hate crimes, 
high medical bills, and widespread civil unrest. While the pandemic may have moved fear of public speaking out of the limelight, because other than being on Zoom or Teams, very few people were taking the leap to speak in public since there were no large gatherings. Reported by VeryWellMind.com, glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking, affects 77% of the population with some level of anxiety regarding public speaking. In my story, I was one of those people. You know that 77% of the population affected by anxiety. Being introverted was my first issue. Not wanting to make a fool of myself was another major issue. I would not say my speaking in public was a phobia, but I would avoid it as often as possible. And when I couldn't avoid it, I overprepared. I stood there shaking like a leaf until it was over. This did extend to smaller gatherings such as a staff meeting or praying out loud at church or Sunday school and in many other social situations. As I moved up the ranks of my professional association, IAAP, I became more adept at handling the stress of speaking in front of people. I would write out my committee reports and give it verbally and then hand it to the secretary for the minutes. I often found myself going off on tangents if I spoke off the cuff, or I would forget how I got to that subject or even the subject I was on and didn't know how to get back there. Or I would forget the real matter at hand. To this day, I need a script, but I hope that by doing more webinars, that will change. Once I was elected president of the local chapter, I was very afraid of messing up our business meetings, only to find out that was the easiest job in the organization. The only problem occurred for me was when I had to steer this discussion back to the topic at hand. When I was required to speak at events, I again would write a script so I didn't forget anything important and I wanted to make sure I remembered everything that needed to be said. There are protocols and thanks that have to be given and kudos to committee members and the like. Some years later, the association decided to forego having an outside speaker for presentations and we took turns giving them to each other. It was a tr great training ground since I was among friends who wanted me to be successful. I still stress about messing up and I do mess up the wording or misspeak, but I'm no longer nervous to record a webinar. After I left the association, I didn't have the call to present for several years and my skills got rusty. It's a skill that when not practiced falls away and has to be rebuilt. But thankfully, rebuilding is a much quicker process than it was initially, but still nerve wracking all the same. I attended a career track seminar many years ago where the presenter had been working for them for over 20 years and she spoke to us about it. I believe they were recruiting at the time and she shared with us how her first audition went. She had her topic and her speaking points she had practiced in the mirror and done run-throughs. She was required to videotape herself and send the tape in for consideration. When she was reviewing her first attempt, she realized that every time she made a point, she clicked her tongue. She never knew she did that. And she asked her family and friends, and they all validated that she did that as a matter of habit. It took her a while to remove it from her speech patterns, 
so she could make the recording and send in her audition tape. And it must have worked because she was still working for them. For me, I find that I have trouble reading a quote from someone because it's not my default manner of speaking. I fumble and stumble over the words, so practice is required before recording or giving a seminar in person. All of this anxiety was a result of life events, of being corrected for using a specific word or saying something my family or spouse thought inappropriate. I'm still fighting that anxiety because my first love and career choice was to teach. I've been told I have a conversational style of writing and speaking, which is great for presentations, but not for other contexts like procedures manuals and other business writing. I guess at my age, and I'm near retirement now, the fact that I've raised four children, been widowed and divorced, lost my father and grandparents, even fired from a job, left other jobs, been through a flood, and almost struck by lightning twice, I'm beginning to live my life for myself instead of everyone else. When I die, all the knowledge I gained throughout my life and my career would just die with me because I didn't share it. So I decided to share it with you on this platform and I hope you find it interesting and informative. I worked as a CSR, customer service representative, for a copier dealer back in the 1970s and 1980s, but only to help sell and train customers on memory typewriters, those old mag card readers that use the IBM cards, and the brand new word processors. I was removed from sales and because I had a nervous habit of scratching my thigh my boss, who had been a salesman for over 30 years, of course didn't remember his first failed attempts at selling and had no compassion or patience to teach me or allow me to grow into the position. Instead, he put the other office worker in the position. She was going through some major dental reconstruction with surgery and braces. She'd recently lost 50 pounds but was still self-conscious and slouched in her chair during demos. When she became pregnant soon after getting the position in the 1980s, unwed mothers were still frowned upon in certain settings. And this boss and his wife were very religious. So they literally moved her to a backroom office rather than out front where the office workers waited on customers and answered the phones. Shortly thereafter, I decided to leave the job because I had been discounted as being a valuable employee. I stayed home with my two small children for five years. I had another baby and was basically happy. Two months after I left the job, they called me to do consulting work. They needed to hire two people to do the job I did by myself and they asked me to come back for a week to train a new user on their devices. I was reminded of the quote by L. Woods as I was writing this, who said, I'll show you just how valuable L. Woods can be. And that was how I felt at the time. I'd gladly take their money when they couldn't find any one person to replace me. And I had been bored and needed more to do when I decided to leave. In the end, I left because I could no longer be kind and obedient to the boss's wife, who didn't want any responsibility unless she didn't like something. So what I'm saying in a roundabout way is to look at yourself and your mannerisms from fresh eyes, like walking into your home with a guest and seeing things that never bothered you before, but through their eyes, you wished you had 
done differently. Watch for ticks, clicks, scratching, slurring, and the dreaded case of the ums or repeating words too often. When you first start out, write a script. As I discussed in the last slide, I'm still working from a script. If you get to the point where you only need bullet points, congratulations. I hope to get there soon. It's an ever-changing and growing skill that will evolve over time while you get better and better at presenting. So my workflow is to start with the PowerPoint and write the slides. This may be backwards to other people, but this is how I generate the ideas and then I expand upon them in the script. I use it as the outline. You can export, ex yeah, that's the right word, export your presentation into notes in a Word document that puts each slide on a separate page. From there, I write my script, explaining each bullet point, using references to websites where I found my researched material or quotes from authors. If pertinent, I'll add a personal story or two just to prove the point. Don't ever copy someone else's published work verbatim. It's considered plagiarism, even if it's not in a written form. Always credit your sources and paraphrase if the source isn't exactly how you wish to portray the point. PowerPoint has a lot of new features and it gives examples of new designs within the chosen theme to jazz up your slides. And I hope you like my slides. I think they're pretty cool. It also allows you to record within PowerPoint itself by creating an MP4 file on top of your slideshow. I plan to do a how-to video on this subject, so I won't go into the details here. Practice makes better. Give your talk in front of a mirror or for your family and friends. So once you write your script, read through it for edits, then read through it out loud. You may want to change some of the wording if you've used a difficult combination of words or if it just doesn't sound right. If you've been given a time frame to fill for content, time a run through to see if you've hit the desired length and rewrite it if necessary. If working with PowerPoint or YouTube, Zoom, or any other video platform, make a recording. Don't stop if you mess up. It likely can be edited or dubbed over. If you mess up the timing of slides, that also can be changed post-recording. Then listen to it. It may be hard to do it first. You won't sound like yourself that you hear in your head. Many actors cannot watch themselves on the screen for this reason. If you're presenting in person, be sure to pause occasionally to look up at the audience. Eye contact is paramount for making them feel like they are part of the discussion. Also, try to speak slowly. It will feel terrible, but measured slow speech is better for the audience to hear you. Also, if the pitch of your voice is high, you may want to lower it purposely. Some people have trouble hearing higher pitch sounds, so using a lower pitch is helpful, especially when your audience is elderly. You also want to watch for your physical and emotional signals of anxiety or stress. They may or may, may not appear during your presentation, but if giving it in person or while you're on the screen, it changes the dynamics with visual cues. According to Psychology Today, while there are people who by nature tend to be more anxious or people who don't think they are good at public speaking, there are certain situations that are likely to make most 
of us more anxious when presenting in a public forum. Lack of experience. As with anything else, experience builds confidence. When you don't have a lot of stage hours under your belt, you are more likely to experience fear of public speaking. Degree of evaluation. When there's a real or imagined evaluation component to the situation, the fear is stronger. If you are speaking in front of a group of people who have the evaluation forms ready to fill out, you may feel more anxious. And in my case, it will make you mess up more than usual. A status difference. If you are about to speak in front of people of higher status, such as your supervisors or their supervisors, or groups of accomplished professionals in your own line of work, you may feel a higher dose of fear tingling through your body. New ideas. If you're sharing ideas that you've not yet shared in public, you may worry more about how people will receive them. When your public appearance involves presenting something new, you may feel more uncomfortable stating your position, taking questions from the audience, or dealing with those audience audience members who try to poke holes in your theories. A new audience. You may already have experience speaking in public and presenting to familiar audiences. You may, for instance, be used to speaking in front of professionals in your own area of expertise. Fear may arise, however, when the target audience shifts. If you're standing in front of an audience that is very different from the people you usually speak to, your confidence may be a little shaky. What to expect. Say you've been asked to speak at a classroom of students in elementary school on career day. Your audience must be taken into consideration so they don't get bored. Visual aids may be appropriate depending on your career and jokes or a funny story may help ease the tension in the room. Don't be surprised if you're among 10 others asked to speak and you'll need to wait your turn and sit through everyone else's presentation. That's actually good for you because you get to watch and know ahead of time to speak what the audience responds to and what they don't. If you've been asked to give a lecture to college age students, the scenario will be completely different so plan accordingly. If you're asked to give a training presentation to your colleagues at work or to a meeting of an association, there are many other things to keep in mind. Remember that these people want you to succeed and they want to learn from you. Your topic may be of interest to them or it may be thrust upon them by a boss or an association leader. During these types of speaking engagements, there are usually meals involved or at least some snacks. Be conscious of drinking too much punch or water before giving your presentation and make sure you use the restroom first. Most places will have a glass or bottle of water available for you at the podium. If not, request one or provide your own. As far as food, some food can coat your throat and cause you to have to clear your throat often. So be sure if you notice any food that does that to you, not to eat it before speaking. If you're speaking at a restaurant or hotel meeting room with a meal provided, the host organization should always provide your meal for free. Many organizations will cover your travel costs for mileage and tolls, as well as an overnight stay if asked to present in the evening or early morning and you live hours away. If you live farther away, discuss reimbursement for airfare, train fare, or other methods of transportation. You may want to talk about Ubers or taxis from the airport if one of their people cannot pick you up. At a certain distance, renting a car is cheaper than paying for mileage, so double check that in your agreement or contract. I've been 
dealt with speakers who base their fee on a number of attendees, which is interesting. If you have 30 to 50 guests, their fee will be a specific amount. If it's 50 to 100, it's a higher amount. You also want to ask about handouts or having your attendees link to a presentation. The people inviting you should always make the handouts for you and have them put on the tables ahead of time. Associations primarily do this as part of the agreement. There's always the chance of sharing your presentation electronically with the attendees. You'll have to decide if you want to do that or not. But if you do, copyright it. Sharing personal stories is always a great way to engage your audience, especially if the story is funny and is germane to the topic. You don't want to go into detail about your children or childbirth experiences, your marriage or divorce, your terrible boss, unless it's related, or any other embarrassing tale of your life. I do use personal stories about my jobs and things that happen to me at work but only if it's associated with a topic at hand. Don't bring up politics or religion or other controversial topics unless it's what you're talking about or a necessary point. The reason for that is obvious in today's atmosphere of political strife and difficulty. I sat through a keynote address by one of my beloved colleagues who is a biology professor with an underwater specialty. He told an absolutely hysterical story about testing diving equipment in Ohio in November in a partially empty underground pool. The water had turned brown with all sorts of things floating in it. He was testing a new helmet and tank system which unfortunately seemed to fail while he was underwater. The first thing they teach you in diving school is to not panic, an attempt to go to the surface. As he was trying to surface and not able to breathe, a dead squirrel had somehow attached itself to his helmet. And it looked like he was waving to him as he was trying to surface. A room of over 100 women were laughing hysterically, almost rolling on the floor, when he brought it back to the subject matter with a lesson. He is a natural, and I hope one day to grow up just like him. While public speaking may or may not be new to you. If you experience nerves and stress, it may show in your voice or throw you off during your presentation. I gave a presentation in Buffalo one night and it started off badly. I couldn't find the venue and the GPS took me downtown and left me there, which was not where I needed to be. I needed to be on the outskirts of town. By the time I got there, I was flustered and unable to eat the meal. And I had to set up my video equipment to record so that we could post it on social media and share with those who couldn't attend. As soon as I turned the camera on, I lost my mojo. I stumbled through the entire presentation. So I refused to share it with anyone. It was a humbling experience and I had given the presentation many times before and it was always well received. I felt so badly that I had not delivered a great presentation to that audience. Sometimes you need to break the ice by doing something unexpected. There's a story in my town about a middle school teacher who would dress up in Civil War uniform and run into his classroom with a sword drawn 
with a battle cry. He certainly got those kids' attention. He is still a legend in town from all the crazy stunts he pulled throughout his teaching career. Have you ever seen those chalk artists who are creating a drawing of a lake, trees, and the moon shimmering across the land in front of an audience? I was in church years ago, and just when we thought he was done, he took two black markers and slashed lines from top to bottom, we thought ruining his creation. There was an audible gasp in the audience, only to learn that they were trees up close. He caught us off guard in a very well-planned move that was completely unexpected. Your voice and knees will stop shaking, really. For in-person presentations, I had gotten to the point where I can start while my entire body is shaking. I hold on to my papers and I run my finger down as I read so I don't lose my place when I look up at the audience. My knees are literally knocking together and I move my stance from one foot to the other to help alleviate it. Hopefully my upper body doesn't move. After about a minute or two, the shaking smooths out and my voice is much clearer and stronger. Please note that if you do speak louder while your voice shakes, it doesn't shake as much. Each person will develop their own method for calming or coping with that anxiety and stress. And then I want to suggest you just be like Nike and just do it. If you want to give presentations, no matter the topic, just do it. You may be shaky and quaky in the beginning, but you'll improve in time. Be proud that you took that huge leap and put yourself out there to share your knowledge with others. Thank you for joining us for The Art of Public Speaking, My Take, presented by Webinars by Rockwell. We appreciate your spending your time with us today. Check back for future announcements of our newly released videos. Bye for now.